the medicine and then emergency medicine, um, just so that people can kind of understand there's a lot of ways to get there. So um, I came out of high school, really interested in math and science, and uh, just to kind of assumed I'd be a double major in college um, and had a background in athletics and was a student athlete in college as well. And um, got to college and thought, oh, wow, okay, lab science is a whole different ball game. Um, I'm not sure that the lab is where I love to spend my life. Um, and meanwhile, I got a, um, like a job, a student um, work study job in the athletic training room at my college and got to treat student athletes while still being a student athlete. And I thought, okay, well, maybe, um, this is a really fun avenue for me to pursue, uh, like math and science type of career without being a lab scientist. So I, um, had by then most completed most of the prerequisites for med school anyway, by being sort of on the track to a bio and chem double major. Um, and uh, went the med school pathway. So I took the MCATs during my junior year of college and then uh, did not have a whole lot of other experience. And so I applied to med school during my senior year and actually ended up um, not getting in until after graduation. So I got in off the wait list in June, right after I graduated from college. And by then I had actually taken a job um, in Ohio. So I went to med school or I went to college in Massachusetts. I took a job um, in Ohio working for a radiologist for the year. I mean, he's really cool. He um, is a radiologist, had been for 35 years, but also um, happened to be a quadriplegic. And so he hired student aides to help him with his daily projects, but then, all, or sort of daily living, but then also helped um, foster students, uh, not foster, it's not quite the right word, but sort of take on students as mentees for a year, um, working alongside him, learning a little bit about medicine, a little bit about radiology, and um, getting this really great experience. So I had already been accepted. Um, I had deferred for the year because I'd already accepted this job and I got to work for him for a year before starting med school um, back at UVM. So I uh, went to UVM for med school and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I had this interest in radiology um, courtesy of my um, time working with him. Um, I had an interest in pediatrics. I've always loved kids and working with kids and I thought that was really neat. Um, and I ended, and then I, I also, my, um, my dad had been a volunteer firefighter when I was a kid. And I always thought that kind of excitement of firefighting and being the first responder, I was occasionally sitting shotgun in the ambulance when we, he would drive to the hospital, that kind of thing I thought was really exciting. Um, so I ended up doing, uh, trying all three radiology, emergency medicine, and pediatrics during my early, my fourth year of med school. And I found myself, um, really loving emergency medicine, the pace, the being the diagnostician, using a little bit of all the skills um, that I had learned in med school, um, being able to do some procedural things um, and really um, getting to do a little bit of everything. Uh, while I was in my second year of residency, I decided that I had a subspecialty interest in sports medicine, um, having grown up as a student athlete, and then again, finding my way into medicine via the athletic training room in college. Um, and I decided to pursue a sports medicine fellowship. So after graduating from emergency medicine residency, I did a one-year sports medicine fellowship um, and then um, found myself kind of here in the um, clinical and academic realm, doing both um, clinical emergency medicine and then having both teaching responsibilities and um, research and writing re um, responsibilities in both emergency medicine and sports medicine. So that is my sort of convoluted path to where I am. Great. Um, thanks, Katie. Should it, Lily, should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. We'll hear now from Rich Bounds. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Rich um, and I am fairly new to Vermont. I came to Vermont five years ago. Um, my path to medicine was that I um, really liked my biology class in high school. Uh, I was the AP bio class, had a really amazing teacher and started to become interested in the sciences and um, considering health professions. This was in kind of um, 10th and 11th grade. Um, my mom was a nurse. I had multiple family members and my family that were involved like as EMTs, um, police, firefighters, um, and a lot of kind of service professions in my family. Uh, no one had um, no one in my family had gone to college though. So um, my goal when I was in high school was to be the first in my extended family to go to college. Um, so um, plan to go to college um, studying science and I really like biology and thought, well, why don't I just push myself and try to do pre-med? Uh, it seems like the hardest thing to do. And that was the kind of person that I was a little bit pathological. 
um, to uh, try to do whatever is the hardest. So I, I did that um, and I really liked all the pre-med classes in college and started to think about um, possibly becoming a physician. Um, I started shadowing uh, and volunteering, um, volunteering in the uh, shock trauma center at the University of Maryland because I was in college in Baltimore. Um, and I uh, did some volunteering as well in some, um, some of the local clinics um, uh, in Baltimore City. There were plenty of opportunities to volunteer uh, through the campus ministry office. And so I participated in those things and did some other uh, service sort of um, uh, volunteer activities. So I just got more and more engaged in kind of healthcare. Uh, really fell in love with the pre-med classes and uh, really enjoyed my time in the hospital, uh, especially in the shock trauma center. I found that very exciting. Um, so I um, decided to continue on the path to medical school. So I didn't take a gap year or anything like that. I uh, went from high school to college and then from college to medical school. Um, and after medical school at the University of Maryland, I went on to Pittsburgh for residency and I did my residency in emergency medicine. Um, so um, that was kind of my training pathway. I considered uh, subspecialty fellowships like what Katie described, but then decided that I wanted to just get clinical experience and start working in the emergency department. Uh, so I did that. I worked in Delaware for 10 years and then um, sort of branched out and took on some uh, teaching roles and administrative roles with the residency program at the hospital where I was in Delaware. Um, and, uh, and then came up to Vermont to start an emergency medicine residency program. Um, so that's why I came up here and I've been here for five years with my family um, and really enjoying that. Um, I was involved in a lot of teaching and administrative work um, when I was at my hospital in Delaware, but then it's much more extensive now. So half my job is is um, uh, in the emergency department seeing patients, and the other half of my job is uh, running a program, an educational program for residents that are learning emergency medicine. Awesome. So I think we were gonna kind of tag team this, but um, as Rich sort of alluded to, um, uh, the medicine is a neat career because there are just a ton of different avenues you can take it in. I think most people think of being a doctor as the clinical part of the medicine. So seeing patients and treating them, I mean, that is a big part. And I would say the vast majority of people who complete medical school go that direction. Um, but lots of people will take on additional roles, um, regardless of their setting, um, whether it is on part of a committee at the hospital, or uh, maybe they're going to do leadership as part of their hospital or their group in their, um, in their uh, hospital they're working in. And then there's academic medicine, which is definitely the minority of people who will do academics as their career. And that's where you work in a um, medical center where there's also teaching that happens, whether it's medical students, residents, fellows, or both. Um, and so this is what Rich and I do day to day um, in terms of our jobs is as academic emergency medicine physicians, we do all of these different roles. Um, so as he said, he's 50-50 clinical and then administrative um, and academic. Um, I'm 60-40, so 60% clinical and 40% academic. I do a lot of teaching in the medical school um, as part of my job as well. Um, and then part of that comes with administrative roles, so making sure that grades get in, making sure that um, teaching sessions are scheduled, making sure um, that students are getting and residents are getting feedback on what they're doing. You're doing direct teaching, so actually giving lectures or um, having workshops where you're teaching. You're mentoring people to get where they want to be in their career, so taking them under your wing. Um, you are publishing and writing. That's part of certainly being an academic emergency doctor is this expectation that you will do, um, you'll further your field um, from a research and scholarship standpoint. And then Rich put this one in last minute, which I just love putting out fires. So as leaders in our field, um, there are small crises every day um, that we're responding to, whether it's someone who called out sick and a shift needs to be covered or um, maybe uh, someone got themselves in a bit of trouble and needs some help digging out of a hole, or um, maybe someone has a question about how to um, like execute a certain project and they want some mentorship on that. And you have to kind of do that last minute, or there's all sorts of other ones. And Rich, I'll let you fill in some of those gaps too. Sure. Yeah. I, I think we have, we wear a lot of hats, Katie and I, and so we um, both have to um, have, have big roles um, outside of the emergency department. Um, and that can vary tremendously based on your interests and 
and really just being in the right place at the right time when a position becomes available or there's a need. Um, so um, these are some ways that you can diversify your career. Um, but for the most emergency positions in most settings, um, the majority of their job is the clinical work. And so um, it, in the emergency department, it's shift work. That's one thing that um, attracts some people to emergency medicine is that um, they come in for a shift, they kind of clock in and they start seeing patients and then someone else comes in and relieves them uh, and they transfer the care of any other patients remaining under their care to the next doctor and they leave and they go home and they don't have a cohort of patients that they're following or um, call or anything like that. In most of medicine, um, a lot of medical fields, people um, take call from home or have patients that are theirs. And a lot of people go into medical school saying they want to have relationships with patients and have follow-up and have ongoing uh, visits and things like that. Um, and there are many benefits to that uh, type of relationship. Um, but Katie and I chose a field where um, we come in and see patients and we go home and, um, and there's a little bit of a there's a benefit to that in that it allows you to sort of separate uh, work and home life a little bit. And so that that's one thing that that is a little bit unique about uh, the field of emergency medicine. In terms of the clinical shifts when you come to work, um, we work very closely with our teams. So we have a team of nurses and techs, social workers, case managers, peer recovery coaches that help people with addiction, um, the EMS providers that bring patients into the hospital. And so it's very much a teamwork environment. Um, in some areas of medicine, it's kind of like, I don't know, the doctor knows best and everyone else kind of follows their lead and the doctor is the one in charge. Um, and there's a little bit more of a hierarchy. But in emergency medicine, I find that um, the doctor, you know, while we are the ones placing the orders and the leader in a resuscitation, um, oftentimes we're all just working together and the nurses will clue me in to, hey, did you catch that the patient's mother was concerned about this? Or the tech might come over and say, um, I, I overheard them talking about this and this is actually what they're concerned about. Or a scribe might tell me, oh, this test result just popped up and I don't think you saw that. And so there's a lot of ways that our, our entire ED team works together to help provide care for the patients that's a little bit unique compared with other areas of medicine where um, it's more like you're independent as the physician. In emergency medicine, you're really, it's really a team environment. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about what the shift um, looks like too, what the work looks like on shift. We have a couple of good questions in the um, chat though. So um, what do oh, you okay. think, um, Lily and Jillian, do, should we address the questions in the chat first or kind of get through and answer at the end. I'm happy to do either one. So we'll address the questions during the Q&A once okay. they're done speaking. Sounds great. Okay. Cool. So um, what does a shift look like? So um, one of the my favorite parts about emergency medicine is that we just take care of anyone who walks in the door for any complaint, any age, um, you know, any socioeconomic status, uh, any gender, um, you know, across the full spectrum. And really anyone who's seeking care and everyone walking in the door believes that they have an emergency that needs treating. And that um, is awesome. It's a great part of the job. We never have to worry about who can pay, who can't. We just literally get to treat everyone who walks in the door. They can come in with anything, a toothache, a sore throat, a stuffy nose, a cough. Hey, I just need a COVID test. I'm new to town and I left my meds at home or like people who have just been seriously injured or people who are, um, on the brink of death or some who are, or even like actively in the process of dying and everything in between trauma, medical, um, kids, adults, it's really like really fun. So what are you going to see when you walk into work? Um, it depends day to day. Um, you never know what you're going to get when you walk into work. And actually I'm a, actually Rich and I are both are incredibly organized and, um, we like to have control of our schedules and our lives and the things we're doing. One of my favorite parts about my job is actually I can't micromanage my shift work. I show up and I take whatever I get and I work through it and then I get to go home. Um, so it, it like forces me to not have that option to be really organized about it. It's just going to come at me how it's going to come at me. Um, so you show up at your time of your shift and like Rich said, you just start seeing patients, but there's also a process by which you help relieve the provider who's going off. So it's called sign, sign out or handoff. Um, 
And so we will actually uh, take over those patients. And that's a time when you really have to make sure you understand what's going on with them because um, you're not there, the one who saw them first. And so that's a really um, critical part to really focus and make sure you understand everything that's going on with those patients. Meanwhile, everyone's still coming into the emergency department. So you're trying to see them when you can. You're overseeing some learners, at least in our setting, um, who are going off to see those patients as well. And meanwhile, um, as Rich had mentioned before, the results are coming back. EKGs are being tucked under our nose. Nurses are coming up to say, hey, I'm really worried about that patient I just put in a room. Your phone rings. There's a patient coming in from an outpatient clinic or from another hospital. Um, and then everything's back on your first patient. So you're going to go back and check in with them, see how they're feeling, talk to them about the next steps in the plan, go see another patient. The phone rings again in the middle of that room. And so it's a lot of task switching, trying to multitask, um, or at least trying to stay focused on each piece and not lose track of any of the pieces, the moving parts that are going on. So um, can feel a little bit chaotic um, and trying to make organization out of that chaos, uh, but incredibly um, rewarding and fulfilling to be that front of the hospital, to be the um, sort of get a subset of the community, to be really helping everybody um, who you can. And um, it's pretty fun. So these are some great pictures of just what life looks like on a clinical shift. So um, this, yeah, so then there's another one. So um, this is one of our residents who's running a um, transthoracic echocardiogram, um, doing an ultrasound of the heart basically during a resuscitation. Here's a picture of what that looks like um, where this patient's getting a, a picture of their heart through their esophagus. Um, there's an EKG machine set up there. There's ultrasound machine, there's drips. So you can see all the bags hanging, lots of staff members. We have respiratory therapy there. There's nursing, there's techs, there's other doctors. There's a doctor at the head there who's doing the, the echocardiogram. She's one of our graduated residents as well. Who's now doing an EMS fellowship. So she's learning um, all things oversight of pre-hospital medicine. Um, and you can see just things start, like all the team members are kind of falling into place. Here's um, what some of our education can look like. Um, so this is some of our learners who are working in the simulation lab to uh, practice some of the skills that they're gonna use in the clinic um, as well to just make sure that they have a grasp on those before they're ha having to use them on somebody um, to help save a life. Rich, anything to add to all that? Sorry. Yeah, no. yeah. It's um, the, we, we, your practice runs the full gamut. Um, a lot of procedures. Um, these are shots of us practicing uh, nasopharyngeal laryngoscopy, which is where you put a, a camera down a person's nose to look at the back of their throat and their airway. Um, and so we just practice on each other. Um, and, uh, but yeah, some of the other photos were showing resuscitations. Uh, so, so the yeah, emergency medicine runs the full gamut. Like Katie said, anyone comes in for anything. And so we often, uh, have trauma resuscitations or cardiac arrest that comes in. And so that's where we have a whole team in the room and we're actively, trying to save this patient's life. Um, there are, and, and then you go from that, uh, once the patient's stabilized, you have to hop out and you get the results back on the CAT scan that was done for the patient with chronic abdominal pain and you see that they have cancer. And so you have to sit down and tell them, um, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but it looks like you have cancer. And so, um, and those are the times where we let the nurses know, hey, don't come in the room and interrupt me right now because I need five minutes. And um, so we, it runs the full gamut, um, all kinds of, of acu acuity and um, types of situations that we deal with. Um, so, uh, and emergency medicine also has opportunities to work with pre-hospital providers uh, in the wilderness setting um, and uh, in all types of environments where we go out into the back country um, with some of our volunteer activities um, to support our, our local EMS units and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a really exciting field where you can branch out a lot into different areas. We train our residents in all types of, of um, sort of areas of emergency medicine, such as pre-hospital care and EMS uh, and wilderness medicine, sports medicine, critical care resuscitations, um, a lot of ultrasound training because we use point of care ultrasound at the bedside. Um, oftentimes rather than sending a patient away for an ultrasound to be done in a, in a different area of radiology, we do it uh, right there um, at the bedside. So, um, so yeah, it's a very exciting field. Um, and uh, yeah. I don't you know mind if, we... if I just jump in and um, yeah. just clarify one thing? So when we say fellowship, just to be clear, so residency is the specialty you choose after medical school. That's kind of your big overarching specialty. And emergency medicine is a specialty. And that's the one that both of us did our residency training in. Mm -hmm. fellowships are subspecialty training. And you guys may hear that thrown around at some of these other sessions, but 
subspecialties within the primary specialty. So when um, Rich is talking about wilderness medicine, EMS, um, sports medicine, point of care ultrasound, there's actually a lot of other ones, medical education, critical care, um, uh, I'm missing a bunch, <laughs> global health, um, neurological emergencies, neurological emergencies, um, bar bar barometric medicine, aerospace medicine, rural emergency medicine, is rural med emergency medicine, um, informatics. So all, <laughs> that's right, informatics, all these different subspecialties that if you have sub interests within emergency medicine and these, um, and so my fellowship, my subspecialty was in sports medicine, but we have people on our faculty who are subspecialty trained in a lot of these different things. And um, so it's pretty neat to work alongside uh, people with subspecialty training and um, expertise as well. So. Great. Yeah. I think we could probably, one of the questions I see is about how we handle stress. And yes, so this it might be a good lead in to like work well here. Balance. Yeah. Um, I personally, I mean, the, the shifts are very stressful. Um, and we did not intentionally put a picture of us drinking beer together on this slide uh, to be about how we handle stress. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's true. Uh, this was a slide to say we get together outside of work a lot to do education and have dinner and talk about journal articles. This is a journal club. We do that every month where we have selected articles uh, with our residents and faculty that we all read. And then we come together to talk about some of the clinical controversies and some of the ways we practice uh, differently than one another um, and some of our Kind of analysis of the literature and the latest uh, findings and so um, this is just what it's like to be a part of an academic program um, in terms of handling stress I, I think you know you you have to come into work um, in the emergency department kind of ready to focus ready to go um, hopefully well rested not always um, and at least well hydrated and fed um, because um, you don't get much time to eat or drink or pee when you're on a shift in the emergency department. Um, and uh, generally, when you do try to go pee, someone calls your phone or While you're sitting on the toilet or pages you yeah. <laughs> in the middle of that. Um, so it, it's um, we don't really take breaks uh, during the shift. So it's very intensive work. Um, and so when you're on, you're on and you can't have other distractions. Um, but then when you're off, you go home and you leave. Um, in general, um, most emergency physicians work about 16 shifts a month or so. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you work overnights and evenings and weekends, it really adds up. For example, if, if I work three overnights in a row um, on uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, my entire weekend is shot. And then Monday and Tuesday, I'm really just recovering and trying to get back to normal. Um, and so that's really like a five day period taken up by those three overnight shifts. And then, um, you know, you work holidays, you work weekends. And so that's one of the downsides. A shift is a shift and it doesn't matter if it's Sunday or Tuesday or Christmas or, um, you know, whatever that may be. So, um, and then, um, a lot of us have sort of routines. Um, I like to try to exercise either before or after work. I commute to work a lot. So my bike ride home is really nice going down spear and seeing the sunset um, in the Adirondacks um, is really kind of a nice way to decompress um, and uh, going for a run after work um, is is I think a healthy sort of thing to do just to clear the mind and clear the head and sort of process all the tragedies you saw that day uh, which can weigh on you a little bit and we um, all have but, our own oh go ahead I'm sorry yeah but we all yeah well, I was going to say we all have different ways of of processing dealing with it we also just talk a lot um, as a group like I said we're a team and so we kind of talk about our feelings and sometimes we cry together um, and we do debriefings um, and uh, talk about the child that died um, today or um, the patient's family that came and gathered as as we couldn't get their heart to beat again and those kinds of things so uh, it can be a very challenging field but also very rewarding in that sense we have a, a, yeah, our group is incredibly supportive of one another um, and really help. We walk, we work through things formally and informally, I would say. So there's formal processes by which we can discuss difficult cases. There's actually a stress um, debriefing uh, peer support network that has um, come together in our group. So one of our um, physicians has led trainings in peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, and so there's that. So if you have a tough case and you want support um, from peers, you can reach out and get that. 
We um, do a lot of things. Everybody has their own things outside of work that make them them and help them decompress and relieve stress and be have outlets for some of the things. And whether it's talking to family members, going for walks, having a pet, whatever, or um, you know, climbing mountains or um, Rich is a bike rider. I'm also a bike rider. I'm also a runner. Um, for Rich and I, it's, it's definitely more athletics than anything else and family, I would say. But um, other people in our group are artists. We have musicians. We have um, writers. We have people who um, have all kinds of other creative outlets for sure. And so um, everybody sort of over the course of your training figures out how they best recover and um, process. And there may be multiple things that they have to do to process. Um, like some, maybe you go for a run and you talk to a peer or you kind of, but, but whatever it is you sort of work through. And I've had one case that I can, two, two cases I can remember in my career where I just couldn't quite get over them. Um, they really stuck with me. And I ended up finding that, you know, if exercise and time weren't doing it and talking to peers, then um, I, I would write about those cases um, and kind of get the emotions out on paper and found that to be really um, helpful. So um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of ways that people deal with the stress at the end of the day. I think, um, it does take a healthy, com um, combination of empathy and feeling and actually having that emotion and also being able to distance yourself just a little bit from a healthy standpoint, uh, just to maintain your, your kind of composure and, and well-being. And so you have to build any kind of both those to a certain extent. Yeah. One question I see about embarrassing moments in med school residency, um, the purpose of med school and residency is to embarrass you. Yes. So you don't, it's not like a moment. It's like the story of your life every day. <laughs> you, you have to um, approach these sort of things with great humility um, and no pride. And there is so, so much to learn um, and that you're always, you just always feel dumb, <laughs> but that's okay because that's medicine um, and that's the human body. Um, and I often tell my learners when they work with me, um, I'll teach them something new or different and they're shocked. Oh, that wasn't how I learned it in medical school. And I explained to them that basically half of what you learn in medical school will be wrong in 10 years mm -hmm. if it's not already. Um, so everything is constantly changing. We're always having new findings, ways that we used to do things. We're being told now the new literature, the new evidence says that's the wrong way to do it. Um, it's, it's, I could give examples, but that would just take up the rest of our time. Uh, <laughs> but there are so many things that, that constantly change so much. And we're always learning um, that uh, you just have to remain very humble. Yeah. And lean into the things you don't know. I mean, I think even as learners where you guys are now to try to really um, dive into things you don't know much about and not, instead of being afraid of those things and thinking, well, I'm not going to get a great grade in physics because I'm not very good at it. So I'm going to kind of shy away from doing that or you know, maybe I'm not a great writer, so I just won't take those writing classes. But actually, ultimately, in medicine, one of the things you learn is that you have to learn the things you're not good at, maybe even more so than the things you are good at. And so starting that practice now of like really leaning into the things you don't know and trying to tackle those um, will only stand you in good stead later when you don't necessarily have that option to keep um, to keep learning at the same level with the same safety network. So just remember in medical school and residency, it's not your license on the line, right? You're, you're learning and you're doing what you can to learn and do your best, but you always have a safety net underneath you to, to catch you. And that's what um, Rich and I do day to day is to make sure that everybody's doing the kind of generally right things for the patients. So, um, yeah. Thank you. And so a question from the chat, what advice do you have for people who are interested in emergency medicine and with that, is there shadowing opportunities or ways students could see what it's like to be in the ER? Yeah, yeah. I was I was gonna say maybe um, the two of you could also mention like scribes and techs, kind of those entry level jobs that can be really good for for students or or post grads to to get into for experience into emergency medicine. Yeah, Rich, you want to tackle that, or do you want me to? Yeah, I I think those those two questions kind of go together, um, which I was probably intentional, but, but yeah, to learn more about the field, you have to spend time doing it or being around it. Um, and, um, and that's actually true, not just emergency medicine, it's true of all of medicine. I mean, a lot of our medical students go to medical school saying, I want to be a physician. I'm not sure what type yet. Um, and, and when they're learning in the first couple of years and they're not really in the clinical environment, they're, uh, learning about neurology and they love the brain and the neurosciences and um, and then they start working with neurologists in the neurology clinic and find oh this isn't actually what I expected and then they really like airway management and they really like 
the anatomy of the airway and they really like the anesthetics um, and some of the, the pharmacology of anesthesia. And then they start working in the OR as anesthesiologists or with that team. And they realize, oh, this isn't actually what I thought it was. So a lot of medicine, um, it's not just the science, it's actually the environment and the people you're around and the feeling of being in that type of setting. Um, and so it's really important to get experience working with the types of people that you think you might be interested in. And so emergency medicine is like that. A lot of people just come into the ED and they say, no way, this is not for me. I do not want to do this field. Um, and uh, others come in and say they really thrive there. So I think anything you could do, like being a scribe, working as a tech, uh, working in EMS, um, uh, volunteering, um, any of those things, or just like during um, medical school or even uh, during college, finding shadowing opportunities to just kind of um, work alongside or, or help out or, or just shadow a physician uh, in whatever field you're interested in is a really good idea. Yeah, sorry, I got hijacked by my children during that, but <laughs> I think covered the bases. I think shadowing opportunities are harder and harder to find for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I think getting work in the field is probably the best way to go. I agree. Or volunteer work. So the hospital does still take volunteers in the post-COVID realm. So um, being an EMT, being a scribe um, are all great opportunities. And it just like Rich said, you don't have to know what specialty you want to do going into medical school. You can absolutely come in and get that experience once you're there. That's built into the experience as well. If you know you want to be a doctor, you, don't you know can also do research. So um, at UVM, a UVM you can student. A course and yeah. you can do one of our MRAP courses, Emergency Medicine Research Associates Program. And you can do research alongside emergency physicians. You can spend time in the emergency department actually enrolling patients in studies and learning about biostats and learning about research design while you're actually spending time in the emergency department. So you're kind of killing two birds uh, with your time. And then at the end of it, you might get a publication. And so that will look good on your CV when you apply to medical school. So those are some options. That was a very great answer. Yeah, I think it's very good to highlight all those potential you know, exposure opportunities. Um, another question, the next one in the chat, uh, you kind of, both of you kind of spoke kind of what your emergency medicine training was like, but they, um, they also was wondering if you could talk more about the type of care you're doing in emergency medicine, which I think is um, a very good question in terms someone of- someone clarify what kind of care they mean? To my understanding, <laughs> Sorry. it might be like in terms of maybe treatments, I don't know. Um, this question was from Peyton. If you want to clarify in the chat or feel free to unmute. Really, we do all of it. <laughs> Everything. Um, um, yeah, so I guess ahead. if you want to, if, if you think about like the most common things that we're addressing in the emergency department, um, chest pain, respiratory distress or terrible breathing, um, trauma, abdominal pain, headache, um, yeah, orthopedic injuries, musculoskeletal Fever. injuries, uh, yeah. fevers, infections, rashes, ra yeah, it runs with lacerations, much. eye complaints, ear complaints. Yes. Yeah, a lot of injuries and a lot of trauma, and then a lot of chronic medical conditions that have gotten out of control um, or are acutely exacerbated by something. So, a patient with heart failure who's doing okay on their meds and their diuretics and their they're maintaining, but then something tips them over the edge um, and suddenly they come in, they can't breathe. Um, you know, um, a patient with emphysema who's on home oxygen and being followed by their primary doctor really well, and then they they get a bronchitis or uh, a, a cold and it just trips their emphysema out of control and they can't breathe and they come in. Um, and traumas is a big part of what we do. Um, in pediatric um, uh, cases, our, our patient population in general, if you just look at a typical day, probably half my patients are over 70, um, I would say, but that's just because patients that are older need to seek care more and have more health problems. Um, so, so there's a lot of geriatrics uh, involved. And psychiatry. And can... We forgot to mention that. Psychiatry. That? A lot oh, yeah. of psychiatry. There's Lots a question too about asking about psychiatry and emergency medicine. So that's actually perfect potential segue. Yeah. And Peyton, I'll just say the last thing I'll say to that question is just that we are, we have a lot of knowledge about everything in medicine. And if we don't have the answer, we know where to find it, or we know who to ask for it. 
Um, we're not surgeons, but we know how to do a really good ex abdominal exam. You know, we're not anesthesiologists, but we're really good at um, making sure that, that putting in uh, breathing tubes in people. We're not radiologists, but we're really good at looking at x-rays. And so I, I had a friend once who's now a residency program director at another um, institution who said, we're the second best at everything. And I think it was a really good way to think of emergency medicine, except I would still argue that we're the very best at resuscitation of really sick people. But um, we do everything, procedures, um, and psychiatry is a big part of that. So people who are in emergent crisis, who are at imminent risk to themselves or somebody else come into the emergency department all the time um, seeking care. And so we do at any given time have um, several patients in the emergency department with complaints of depression, or maybe their um, mental health illness um, is also decompensated and out of control. They have a chronic mental health illness. And, and that is also something like a stressful episode or forgetting to take their meds for a few days, something like that has tipped them over into a, like a psychosis or um, something like that, or um, people who've tried to commit suicide or have been out to hurt, hurt other people because of their mental illness. Um, we see a lot of, so we work very closely with our um, mental health clinicians, um, psychologists in the community who are trained in, um, in assessing patients with mental health crisis. And we do a lot of the medical components of that, but also we're the second best psychiatrist in the hospital. So we're also the ones who assess um, what's going on with their mental health. And then we interface really closely as part of this interprofessional and interdepartmental um, piece of the emergency department. We interface really closely with the psychiatrist as well to make really safe plans for these people to get the care they need as well. And it's just like as if we were treating someone with abdominal pain or chest pain. Um, we're gonna deal with the pulmonologist. We're gonna deal with the cardiologist. We're also man, um, kind of interfacing with the psychiatrist to make sure that people get the care they need. Yeah, we're really kind of like the coordinators of care for a lot of people. We're kind of bringing all the resources together for people. Um, and I'm, I'm a very competitive person. So instead of saying I'm the second best at everything, I'd like to say that emergency physicians are the experts at the first hour of everything. That is awesome. uh, so we can handle the initial resuscitation, the initial treatment uh, for the first hour. And then once we get patients stabilized, we usually have them get admitted to the hospital to be cared for by an internist or have them go see another specialist or other expert um, to get them to the right place. So a lot of medicine is making the diagnosis and solving a problem. In emergency medicine, a lot of times it's just getting the person to the right place or getting them the resources they need, whether it be um, help with food insecurity or whether it be a surgeon to take out their appendix. Yep. And to that point, we don't always, um, a lot of medicine is finding the answers. We don't always find the answer. That's another really interesting thing that I think distinguishes emergency medicine from other specialties is that we aren't always the definitive care. And um, sometimes people will come into the emergency department with chest pain and there are seven life-threatening causes of chest pain that we have to make sure is not what's going on. And once we've ruled those out, we may not have a good explanation for the patient's chest pain, or we may, but we may not, but we can at least send them home saying it is not a scary cause. And um, that is something we're really good at is, is making sure um, that we're not missing anything scary. Thank you. Another question from the chat, going off of the experience aspect, how do you handle situations where a patient's life is in your hands and you have to make an executive decision that you don't feel confident in? That's a great question. All the time. All we the have, time. So one of every the day we, we make do. very difficult decisions with yeah. very limited information. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's just what our job is. Um, patient comes in and they have no medical records and never been to this hospital. They just got off the plane from Florida and they're unresponsive and they can't speak to you and there's no family and you have to figure out what to do. Um, or patients come in and have a whole gamut of medical records you have to sort through and gather all the information um, and everything in between. A lot of patients come from nursing homes um, and every time you call a nursing home, they do not answer the phone. That is just a given. <laughs> yeah. um, or the person answers and they tell you, oh, that was the last shift and I don't know that patient. So we, we have to make a lot of difficult decisions. And so we just do the best we can with very limited information. Um, and then going back to the humility piece, another part of being an emergency physician, because you're always acting and making decisions with such limited information is that um, you, you get Monday morning quarterbacked all the time. And what that means is patients who admit the or physicians and care providers who admit the patient to the hospital or see them in follow up, look back with all this information and this whole course and how the patient did and the results of their 
MRIs and the consultant recommendations. And they look back and say, oh, how did that idiot not know that when they saw the patient in the emergency department? Um, so they don't, a lot of times people don't recognize that we don't have all the information from the beginning. And so our care is often questioned. Um, and so you just have to have very thick skin as an ER doctor to know that you did the best with what you had to work with in the moment and with the limited information that you had accessible to you um, and made the best decisions you could. Um, but it does take humility. And um, a lot of people actually don't go into emergency medicine because of that. Um, that aspect of the job um, or leave the specialty and go into something else because it's just too hard to be constantly um, questioned in that way. Yeah. And I just would piggyback onto that just to say that we are, um, yeah, we, that's like what we're trained to do. So it's not that every day we're flying by the seat of our pants and it's all new and we don't know what we're doing. So a big part of our training is that you see lots and lots of patients who come in undifferentiated without a clear cause of their symptoms and you have to work through that. And so you learn how to pack, like recognize patterns of illness. You learn how to try a bunch of things off the bat that aren't going to help, aren't going to hurt them, but might help them. You're going to, you learn to get everything back on backup so that if things don't go right, you're ready for the next steps. And so that's all we're trained to do that. That's our, edu that's our education. And so, um, you are kind of flying by the seat of your pants, but with a lot of, um, a lot of reasons why you're doing what you're doing. And it's, it's very intentional. And then the other thing I'll say is that sometimes when you go home after a day of making a lot of decisions, things like, what should I make for dinner are overwhelming. <laughs> so there are days I come home and the decision fatigue is real. And my family says, what do you want to make for dinner? And I say, uh, anything we can have cereal. I don't care. I can't make another decision today. And that um, is also really very real. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, yeah. And a lot of times when you have to make a difficult decision, um, it, it's, you have, you just have, have certain kind of priorities or values or just ways of approaching problems. And so first do no harm is, a, is kind of a part of the Hippocratic oath uh, in, in, med in all of medicine awesome. is what I'm going to do for this patient going to harm them or help them. And you're constantly sort of weighing risks and benefits of everything that you might want to do. And there are some patients that come in and, and have a major problem and need some treatments, but the best thing for us to do is just slow down um, and not do anything aggressive and just admit the patient to the hospital to have them seen by specialists and have people slowly sort of evaluate the condition to determine what the best course of action is. And so um, we are very thoughtful about the decisions we make and what we do and keeping in mind that we don't want to hurt someone, we want to help. And if, um, if kind of that making that decision might be tenuous and might cause harm, then we hold off. And that's part of the interprofessional uh, relationships we have too. Just going back to what Rich was saying initially is that we're working with all these other sub experts within the emergency department. So nurses, right? Like they have seen a lot of patients too, and they might have some really great ideas. Our respiratory therapists can have some phenomenal ideas about ways to try to help um, somebody. Our pharmacists, you know, daily, they say, I think this medicine would be better than that, or this medicine can cause that harm in this patient. Let's do something different. And so you're also surrounded by this team of people you can ask sort of their opinions too. And I think um, because of it's teamwork and because we don't, because we're humble and because we don't feel like we're the top, top of a totem pole to go over to the nurses who are experienced and say, what do you, what would you guys do? What do you think? What should we try next? And to, to be able to use that input as part of our medical decision-making is, is really critical. Thank you. So we'll move on to the case study portion, and then there'll be a little bit more time to answer questions at the end. So we'll let you take that away. All right. Um, I think we sort of like we're sort of doing that a little bit um, because there is no one good example of what a case in the emergency department. Well, unless you had this in mind, Rich, I didn't have anything specific. Not really. I mean, I can talk about my last trauma case. Um, I can too. I sure. Um, yeah. So that was, this is just a typical trauma case. So um, it was a patient that was brought into the emergency department um, and they had been struck by a car. So pedestrian struck is the, is the alert that comes across on our pagers. Um, and it was a gentleman that was heavily intoxicated and had walked into traffic and got hit by a car and both his legs just below the knees, both legs were clearly broken. Um, and, uh, and he had facial and head injuries, uh, lots of blood and, and swelling on his face. And so he's brought in by paramedics, by EMS, immobilized on a spine board. 
uh, with a collar around his neck to immobilize it and prevent him from hurting himself more. Um, and so this is a picture of kind of our trauma pathway. And you can see there's like a trauma captain, a chief resident um, standing at the foot of the bed. That was one of our emergency medicine residents. He's a, he's a senior, uh, so he's leading the trauma. And then there's a surgery resident um, doing what they call the ABCs or the primary survey. It's, a, it's kind of a protocol to start looking at the airway, assessing the breathing, assessing the patient's circulation by feeling for pulses, listening to the heart, um, and that sort of thing, and then going through looking for what disabilities they have. So, so we do the primary survey, and the, the patient is being resuscitated. His blood pressure drops because he's lost a lot of blood somewhere, so we're searching for where he's bleeding um, with ultrasound examinations at the bedside, uh, shooting x-rays, examining him, um, carefully rolling him over to look at his back, um, and both legs, um, you know, are, are bleeding because the bone is coming through the skin. It's called open fractures. Um, and at the same time, we have um, a refrigerator in the emergency department that stores blood, so it's ready to be given. And so we get a couple of units of the O negative blood, and we hang it through what's called a rapid infuser. Um, and so that can get blood into a blood transfusion into the patient very quickly within ten minutes. And um, all this is taking place with multiple people and nurses getting IV access, intravenous access to give the blood and to give medications for pain. Um, all the while, there's someone at the head of the bed talking to the patient, trying to keep him calm, and he's yelling, and he's kind of crying out and keeps trying to get up, and we're telling him to stay still, and every time he tries to move, he moves his legs, and, and then they're flopping all over the place because they're clearly uh, shattered, um, and uh, so we um, have an orthopedic doctor who comes in and tries to get some plaster and make some splints out of plaster, but that has to harden and it takes too long. And we're trying to resuscitate the patient and rush into the CAT scan. And so we go to the storeroom, we grab some cardboard boxes and some duct tape, and we mold the cardboard around his legs and we wrap the duct tape around it really fast to try to get him to the CAT scanner to determine where the injuries are and if he has to go to the OR. And the whole the while I'm thinking as we're resuscitating the patient and assessing him, should we just put him to sleep and paralyze him and put a breathing tube in to try to calm everything down. But then the neurosurgeon is also there saying, if he has a massive head injury, I want to be able to talk to him and get a neurological exam and know what, what he can do functionally. So there's a risk of putting him to, to sleep and paralyzing him because then I can't assess him anymore. So try to keep him calm, maybe give him a sedative to keep him from moving around too much and fighting but if you give him a sedative, it drops his blood pressure more and he's already hypotensive. And so those are all the things that we're grappling with and trying to assess and trying to do to resuscitate the patient all at the same time. And all that happens over the course of you know, 20 minutes um, until we get the blood, patient's blood pressure up from 60 up to 100 to the point where we feel comfortable taking him next door to the CAT scanner in the emergency department to put him through a scan of the body to look for where the injuries are so that we can know what type of surgery he might need next. Um, so yeah, that was exciting. And all the while, uh, while I was in there, um, they were calling me to say that, uh, heart attack that got, uh, that just came from the field is in the next room. And I said, I can't step out of this room right now because I was actually holding his legs and pulling them. So he stopped kicking and I could try to keep them stabilized while they wrap things around them. And so I had one of my colleagues see the heart attack that came in. And then when another trauma came in at the same time, I sent my senior resident, to go assess that trauma patient, um, which was a, a big head bleed. And the neurosurgeon was trying to go back and forth between the two rooms to assess the two patients. Um, and then all while that was happening within that 30 minutes, everybody else in the emergency department just had to wait. Um, and so once we got done in there and the patients were stabilized, then we kind of quickly made rounds and explained I'm sorry, your results came back. I know that you, you can see them on my chart on your phone and they've been back for 30 minutes, but I couldn't get into, I couldn't get away from these other patients to look at them. And so now we have your results back and I can send you on your way with this prescription and, and that kind of thing. So that's just a typical day. Yeah, I can tell you, I had a case on Sunday night um, where a um, patient came in from transfer from another hospital with a um, diagnosis of heart failure, congestive heart failure, which causes difficulty breathing and a lot of fluid in the lungs. And so he arrived and he was breathing like this. <gasps> and we thought that's not heart failure because we do pattern recognition and we've seen a lot of things. That's an obstruction of his airway up high. 
Um, and so in the middle of the night, I quickly started thinking about how am I going to secure this man's airway? I need to figure out why that's happening. And I can't lay him down because he stopped breathing. He's really sleepy. So clearly already this is affecting him. His oxygen levels are low. If we don't have oxygen on him and we're kind of trying to keep him awake, it's midnight. Um, and it's Sunday night and it's midnight or no, it's Monday night. It's Monday night and it's midnight. So it's like now Tuesday morning. And I think, okay, so what am I going to do? Am I going to paralyze this man and try to take a look and put a breathing tube in him? But if I fail at that, what am I going to do next? Well, it's not going to be a lot of recourse because there's, he actually had had surgery and he'd had radiation and he had an old scar in his neck. And so for me to like do a last ditch effort, surgical airway was going to be really impossible. So this was a good example where I got all my friends on board and I called um, our anesthesia colleagues and I called our ear, nose and throat doctor colleagues and they all came up and we did one of those nasal scopes that you guys saw pictures of earlier and took a look and his, his um, vocal for, uh, cords weren't moving at all when he breathed, they were staying closed, totally shut, um, which was making that noise. And we weren't sure what was below them because we couldn't see it. And so the decision was made as a big team um, to take him with, you know, respiratory therapy was giving some ideas. How about heliox, which is a mixture of helium and oxygen, which can be easier to breathe. We had tried a mach uh, machine to breathe on with a mask called the BiPAP. He didn't tolerate it very well. And so, um, the decision was made to take him to the operating room to have all of the things in more of a controlled setting and um, everybody on like anesthesia and ear, nose and throat sort of ready to do both of their procedures at the same time to try to get this man's airway under control and to get him admitted to the hospital to figure out why this was happening. Um, so kind of, again, like thinking on our feet, but also using the whole team and being ready. If this man stopped breathing, I was going to have to try something, right? Because, but I wasn't going to try to do something off the bat because he was still breathing and it was this first do no harm. If I did an intervention, I was really putting him at risk of just killing him right there. And that's really, really not what we want to do. So you act if you have to, but your other job is to get the safest situation with all the, the people who are the experts in that um, on board. So. Thank you. We have a little time left to do a final Q and A, as well as if everyone in the chat could put where they go to school, it would be really yeah, great. It would be great. Um, but I have a question. What was it like adapting to the ER during COVID and when that hit? Yeah, well, we're adaptable in the ED. That's sort of what we're the best at. Um, we are used to changing conditions and um, changing practice. And um, so this was just one more big thing we had to adapt to. It was pretty shocking, right? Just like it was for everybody else. But the medical pieces of it came together and people around the world were doing great research and publishing and showing their experiences really before we got hit very hard. And so we had to um, make sure we had enough personal protective equipment. We had to understand the disease process, what to look for, what it looked like, how to diagnose it, um, how to treat it such as we could. Um, and so, uh, and actually, you know, for a while, people really didn't come in to the emergency room for much of anything. We wondered where the strokes went, where the heart attacks went and um, all this, all this stuff, appendicitis, like those can't have gone away, but they stopped showing up in the ER for a while as people were really scared of COVID and not wanting to overburden us because of what was going on in the news and not wanting to get exposed because they assumed that's where all those patients were hanging out. And, um, so, you know, it was a big adaptation. Everyone had to learn the processes around that. We changed around our room settings and what was in it. We designated rooms for patients for COVID. We had two new wings built in the emergency department specifically for COVID patients um, with negative pressure so that the COVID you know, um, viral particles would be aerated out. And so that if we had a bunch of patients with breathing tubes that we couldn't, didn't have space in the hospital for, we, had, we were ready. And then we got really lucky in Vermont because people in Vermont were really responsible and really did a great job with the distancing and taking care of each other. And so we never saw that huge influx. We definitely see lots of COVID, we did from the beginning, but um, I don't feel like from a COVID standpoint, the hospital ever really got overwhelmed with COVID. I don't know, Rich, if you have a different... Well, ICUs did at one point <laughs> That's true. For, for a period of time. Um, and the hard thing about COVID for the hospital was just like cohorting the patients and figuring yeah. out where to put them so they don't infect each other. But but yeah, we, we're just very adaptable. We built tents and we had everything ready and we I, I worked some shifts outside in the tent. Yep seeing patients out there like in their cars and having to get out of the car and into a tent and things. And, um, but we also, um, we just have to adapt. Like now it's boarding is the big problem. Boarding means when a patient can't get a room upstairs because the hospital's full, they stay in the emergency department for days, even though they're admitted to the hospital and take up that room. And so we see all the new patients that come in in the waiting room or in the hallways, um, rather than actually see them in rooms with monitors and, and all the equipment we need. So, um, we adapt to that, um, and uh, 
we uh, adapted when the cyber attack hit the UVM Medical Center um, and we lost all of our electronic medical records. Um, talk about not having information. So you could not look up a patient's past medical history, medications, notes from their doctor. Allergies. Anything. So okay. it was like every patient, all you could get was just from talking to them. Uh, and we did that for, we thought it would last a couple of days. It lasted over a month of no electronic records on anyone. Um, and so we just pulled out a bunch of paper and we started working that way. Um, and, uh, and got, uh, yeah, got got used to it and, and it made it work. But you have to be very adaptable for sure. And there's a little bit of a gear up around monkeypox so that we understand that. There's a little gear up around um, Ebola is that sort of to ramping up in, in Africa again. So we're constantly learning what's going on in the world um, and trying to adapt our practice and make sure that we're on the cutting edge of what's out there and what, what could show up in our emergency department. Yeah. Wow. Um Thank you for, for sharing about that. And then, you know, just, we love to ask our, our panelists a final question of what is your favorite part about working at UVM Medical Center or with the Vermont population in general? So we'll finish from hearing from both of you. Rich, I'll let you go because you have to duck out. Oh, okay. Yeah, for me, it's the people. I really like my team, uh, the nurses <laughs> and the techs and everyone that I get to work with. They're super friendly and everyone here is really dedicated to the community. Um, so I find that the places that I've worked that are bigger cities or larger areas, there's a little bit of a disconnect. You just feel like, oh, these are just more patients. But but here, you really feel like it's a small town feel and you're taking care of your neighbors and people that, you know, you might see at the Hannaford the next day and, uh, you know, just people that are part of your community. So I really do get that community feel here, not just with my team in the emergency department, but also throughout the hospital. So at UVM Medical Center, the, there's a lot of um, really nice relationships across the hospital amongst all the different physicians and all the providers. And so it, it while it's a big hospital, big, big tertiary care center, it just feels like a small hospital and a, and a community. Um, so I think that's my favorite part about um, working in this setting. Yeah. And my favorite part about Vermont patients is that they're very stoic. <laughs> um, and they don't want to come into the hospital and get admitted. Um, and, uh, and they're like, they're a tough, a tough, um, tough crew, tough population. Yeah, I agree. But also mostly very grateful for the care and very nice. Um, and I agree that people, um, make the job the best. I mean, I love emergency medicine ever. I've ever practiced it. Um, but I think, uh, we have a really special team here across the board, both you know, physicians, PAs, someone asked a question about interfacing with physician assistants. We have an awesome team of PAs that we work with, um, who are on our teams that we work with all the time, every day. Um, our nurses, our techs, and I just like to get to know them personally. They start to trust me. I trust them. Um, and we then have this great working relationship, um, in the patient rooms, but then we get to like kind of banter outside of rooms and chat about life and our families and, you know, rich is rich bikes with my husband pretty regularly. And his daughter comes and babysits for my kids. And like, there's a lot of these just um, reciprocal relationships. I have, there's a lot of um, families with kids about the same age who play together, go to school together. We, we help each other out of our daycares closed or kid has to get picked up sick. And we kind of, we just, it's, it's like just a really great supportive group of people. And so, you know, you talk about the stress of the job and the challenges around it, but I think ultimately um, being surrounded by amazing people who are there um, to help other people and to help you. Um, it's just really phenomenal. Also, Vermont, the recreation is just so close. You can you can have all of those outlets for the things that help make you well and help make you enjoy your life outside of work so much too, because it's right here. I mean, the skiing, the lake, uh, biking, everything is right here. You don't have to go very far, um, which I think is really unique actually in the country in terms of big medical centers, academic medical centers where you can um, leave work and go ski in the same day. It's pretty great. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for being with us tonight and donating your time. We truly appreciate it. And we're excited for next month. We'll be hosting an oncology panel. So oh. make sure to do that. And thank you everyone for joining tonight. Thanks again, everyone. Yeah. Thank you to thank you. Katie and Rich. And mm -hmm. we hope, I hope everyone has a great night. We'll see you next month. Thanks. Take care.